All right, so last class, we talked about track trees. This is as far as we got. Um, so we're going to consider part two, uh, recover partial traffic from external observation. We'll consider that node is sort of completed. And what we'll do is we'll quickly, without going into a lot of detail, we'll look at this one. And uh, we'll spend a lot of detail on, on the third one, including today and, and next week. Uh, so let's just remind ourselves. Uh, so, so the application is HTTPS. And what HTTPS gives us is a secure tunnel to a server or a website. And if we want to read the traffic that's going back and forth over this tunnel, uh, what I suggested to you is that there's three kind of basic things that we might think about in terms of attacking this. Uh, so the first is we might try to actually break into the tunnel. So we'll talk about this one uh, first. Last class we looked at, well, maybe you can't break into it, but even if you observe from outside the tunnel, you do see it's not like it's not literally like a tunnel, and you have no idea whether things are going back and forth. Okay, things are going back and forth. You can see them. Uh, the only problem is that uh, they're encrypted. They're sort of scrambled up. Okay, but it turns out you can infer a lot. Like you can know what domain people are going to. Uh, encryption is length preserving, so you can get a sense of the size of the packets, and you might be able to infer what exact page they're looking at. And there were a few other examples that. Um, so you're, it's not completely useless to actually just look at HTTPS traffic, have no ability to decrypt it, but still infer some, some information about it. Uh, the final category of attack that we'll consider, the one that we'll consider most, <coughs> is um, a tunnel's only useful if it ends at the web server, if you end where it thinks it ends. Events, okay. All Alice really knows is she's dropping messages into a tunnel. Okay. But if this tunnel doesn't end at the web server, if it ends at the adversary, or her computer ends the tunnel before the packets even leave her computer, then the fact that she's putting them in a tunnel really is useless at the end of the day. Okay. So you want to really be sure that you know where that uh, tunnel ends. And a basic attack would be if you're an attacker, get the tunnel to end at you instead of going all the way to the web server. Okay. Um, so where the tunnel ends, we call authentication, server authentication. And so we're going to try and subvert that through various mechanisms. OK, so let's, uh, let's think about the second, or sorry, the first category. OK, so this one. <coughs> Uh, is done. Uh, so now let's think about, we're going to break into the tunnel. Okay, this is an encrypted course. Uh, the tunnel is basically the product of cryptography. Okay, so Encryption functions, signature functions, max, um, hashes as a primitive that's used by max and signature functions. Uh, these are all things that are involved. Uh, extractors, uh, maybe some key derivation. Uh, so there's there's a lot that uh, SSL does under the hood. When I teach 6110, for example, we spend the whole course basically learning all the components of HTTPS, and then very at the very last class you finally can understand end to end what's going on in HTTPS because it really uses a whole mix of, of all sorts of different things. Um, anyway, this is not 6110. I can't assume that you necessarily took 6110. And so I'm not going to try and teach you the crypto. It, it would be too much. Um, so what we're going to do instead is we're going to focus on the big picture. I'm going to write down names of things. You won't necessarily know what those things mean. If you want to do some follow-up you know, research because you're interested in it, or if it catches your interest and you have to do a project for 6110, 
or maybe you want to do a project in this course because you have a crypto background and you want to focus more on crypto, uh, then that's these are like some pointers to things that you might want to look at. Okay, if they don't mean anything to you, they don't mean anything to you, then that's fine. But I will try and give you at least a high level of idea of what's going on. Okay. So the question is, if we want to break into the tunnel, what is it that really protects the tunnel? What is it at the end of the day? Uh, if we can reduce that protection down to something, what is it that we're going to reduce it down to? Okay, so someone commented encryption. So that's the true. Key. So encryption, what what protects encryption? The key. Key, okay. So there's key. So encryption is garbage if you don't have keys, right? Um, so basically you have some keys. Now, what do we mean by the key? What is the key? So a key is a random number, yeah. So a key is a long random number, kind of like a password. But I should phrase it different. What key? Whose key? So the, we know what a key is. We know that some people have these keys. Are you in public or and what, private? What or keys are we talking about? Public or private? Exchange between us. OK, like so public key, private key, DNS keys. What is it? What does private mean? What is a private key? OK, so it's secret. So it's definitely not public key. Public keys are public. If you know about cryptography, then it's not the public key. Uh, is it the private key that goes along with the public key encryption scheme? No. no. OK, so the end, at the end of the day, uh, TLS actually layers a couple things. It, it has a couple layers of encryption. There are public keys that are involved, and they're really to achieve server authentication. <coughs> they're really to make sure that you are talking to the right person. Once you establish that you're talking to the right person, what you do is you actually establish what's called a symmetric key. So symmetric means that Alice has a copy, and the web server has the exact same copy. Okay. And so the core of the tunnel, to get to that point where you have that shared key, you do have to use some other keys. Okay, so there are other keys that are involved. But we're not going to consider the whole protocol. We're just going to zoom into that one point where um, they've done the whole handshake, as it's called. And now at the end of the day, Alice has a secret key. The web server has a secret key. They're exactly the same. Uh, Alice uses it to encrypt. The server uses it to decrypt. Then the server uses it to encrypt the return traffic. It turns out you actually have two different key pairs, one for incoming and one for exploiting, but these are all details that don't really matter. Okay? Then what you're going to do is you're going to use what's called symmetric key encryption. Okay, So it's an encryption function uh, where you assume that both parties have the exact same keys. Okay? Uh, if you've taken 6110, uh, something like a block cipher or something like a string cipher, cipher would be examples of this. Okay? Uh, TLS actually gives wide support so it doesn't say we're going to do encryption exactly this way. It says that we support five kinds of encryption. Uh, there's a negotiation that happens. So the user says, I support these four. Server says, great, I support the top three on your list, so let's just do the first one. Okay, so basically you go back and forth with what you both support. You try and find the strongest thing that, that both of you support, and then that's what ends up uh, being used. Okay, uh, we'll circle back to that. Um, one attack would be that if you're in the middle, when the server says, I support this really strong thing, you might say, you might replace that message with, I support this really weak thing. Okay, so that's called downgrading. And that, that will be relevant, and there are some attacks along those lines. But uh, let's go back and assume that they're able to negotiate uh, strong encryption. Okay? Um, block ciphers are things like AES. So AES is supported. There's earlier predecessors to AES that are in older versions of TLS, things like DES and triple des. And then for stream ciphers, uh, the main one that was supported, although is now depreciated, uh, is called, or uh, deprecated, I was that wrong, is uh, RC4. Okay, and there's actually some very specific problems with RC4, but um, we'll talk about that in a sec. Okay, now what we're gonna do is we're going to, uh, so let me write down what actually protects the tunnel. Um, so at the end of the day, you basically have keys, a uh, shared secret key. And then once you have a shared secret key, you can use this to do encryption. Okay, So you can use 
uh, with inception. <coughs> so if I want to attack the tunnel, first off, it's sufficient if I can get the key. If I can get your key, then I don't have to do anything with the crypto. The crypto could be perfect, but if I can get the key, if I can lift it either off of Alice's computer or lift it off the web server somehow, then I'm done. That's, that's sufficient, okay? Uh, so uh, the first kind of sub attack we might think about is doing some sort of key recovery or steal the key, key theft. Okay, and then the other sub attack is if we can't get the key, then maybe we can attack the encryption, okay? So we can break the encryption. So what does it mean to break encryption? So without going through all the details of encryption and security definitions and things like that, you can think of it as, well, an extreme example would be you could look at something that was encrypted, and even though you don't know the key, you could decrypt it, okay? Um, now it turns out that when people break TLS, the encryption was never, even like the older versions of encryption, they were never that bad, okay? So it was never a case where you could just look at ciphertext and decrypt it, okay? But what you could do is you could look at it and get some partial information. So what does partial information mean? So that might mean something like you could decrypt the 50th byte bit, but not the 51st bit, okay? Most of them even weren't like that, but there is one specific example where partial means that like there's bits in specific positions you might be able to do some work on. Or the more common definition would be that you could look at it and if you don't know anything about it, the chance that that bit is either a zero or one or it's 50-50. Okay, that means that's what no information means. I have no idea what that bit is. It's as likely to be a zero or a one. Sometimes you could do some crypto attacks that would tell you there's an 80% chance that bit's a one. Okay, so you still haven't 100% decrypted it, but you have a good guess as to what it is. Okay, so that's one way you can do it. Yeah. How would that be? Uh, so then what you could do is, yeah, so uh, can you save that question? Okay, okay, save that question, I'll give you a very specific example. Um, the other thing that you might do is you might have a guess as to what's being encrypted, okay? So you might say, I can't encrypt it, if I look at it, I have no idea, but I have this guess, and if I'm right, I can ask for my guess as to what's being encrypted to be encrypted, I can compare that to what's actually being encrypted, and I can infer whether they're the same thing or not, okay? So if I have no idea what's being encrypted, I will never guess it because the number of things that can be encrypted are too big, okay? But if I have very specific guesses, uh, then I could try, and there's not too many of them, then I could try them, and I could try and figure out what it is that's being encrypted, okay? Um, so anyways, that's what, what it means to break encryption. So it's usually always in a kind of partial. A partial decryption, not like a full-fledged straight up decryption. Uh, so no relationship. So separate attack. Uh, so fingerprinting I think of as you're standing outside of the tunnel. Now we're actually trying to break in the tunnel. Itself. So you're talking about cryptanalysis like specific for each. Yeah, so yeah. it's fair to call almost all these attacks. The key theft maybe not, but these ones are all yeah. cryptanalysis. Okay, so key theft, um, you're never going to get the key, well anyway, so there's no theoretical attacks like this where you can just sort of look at the traffic going back and forth and just say, oh I know what the key Okay. Nothing breaks that elegantly. Usually when you steal the key, it actually comes down to an implementation flaw. Okay. It's because the, you're, you're actually stealing it from a server that's not protecting it well enough, or you're stealing it from a computer that's not protecting it well enough. And there are some sort of uh, n indirect ways of trying to leak that information out by explo exploiting uh, implementation flaws. Okay. Um, <coughs> So that's, that's that category. Um,
Okay, and then here we'll I'll also put downgrade attacks. So that's where you try and reduce the encryption to um, some lower level of encryption, even maybe all the way down to zero encryption. Okay. So, anyways, I'll spend a little time on on these three things, uh, but these will be our three kind of sub notes. I'll, I'll kind of pencil them. Okay. So we'll do implementation uh, attacks uh, key theft. Uh, we'll look at breaking the encryption directly. I'll call it attacks on protocol. I'll call this attacks on uh, on implementation. Just call it lost here. Okay, and then the third category is uh, a downgrade <coughs> attack. That's technically attack on the protocol. So we'll, we'll think about downgrade, and then we'll think about uh, partial uh, decryption without the Okay, uh, so let's, we'll just go in order, I guess. Uh, keep that. Okay, so there's two ways to seal the key. First off, we're not clear which key. Uh, so in some cases, you uh, are actually stealing uh, this session key. In some cases, you're stealing a key that will allow you to set up the session key. But those differences, we're not going to go through in detail. Okay. Um, how do I seal a key uh, from, let's say, I'm looking at a web server? Okay. So one thing is I could maybe break into the server, breach it, something like that. So there's some sort of attack on it. Um, so that's that's one thing I can do. Now it turns out that there was actually uh, a big breach uh, that allowed exactly that. Uh, so it's an uh, attack that was called Hartley. And it's an attack, I'll describe the details of it because it's kind of interesting. Um, it's an attack on OpenSSL. OpenSSL is an implementation of SSL TLS. Uh, it would be used, um, well, it could either be used by Alice via her browser or it could be used by the web server. More generally speaking, it's used by web servers than by clients. Um, most clients, if you're gonna use an SSL library, it's going to be either one that's supplied by your computer. So Windows has one, uh, you know, Mac has one, uh, or it's being supplied by your browser. Uh, so Google has their own SSL stack. Uh, Firefox has one as well, or Mozilla, okay? Um, so that's the sort of uh, client side. Server side, uh, once again, it's also uh, going to be supported by the operating system. Um, there's another option uh, client side, which is if you use Linux, usually you use Firefox, so you're probably going to get Mozilla's, it's called NSS, that's probably the library that you're going to end up using, but maybe it's set up and you'll, you'll end up using OpenSSL, okay? Client side, open source software, or sorry, server side, open source software is used a lot more, okay? So there's lots of servers that run Linux, uh, way more than, than clients that run Linux, okay? And almost all the servers that run Linux um, they're, well, not most of them, the majority, the vast majority are running something called Apache. Uh, so that's an IBM, it's an open source thing that's contributed heavily uh, to by IBM. And uh, the most common support for Apache to implement HTTPS is OpenSSL. So there's ways of using Apache without using OpenSSL, but anyways, the most common configuration is you're gonna use Apache as your operating system and then you're going to use, which runs on Linux. So Linux, then Apache, then uh, OpenSSL, okay? Um, so anyways, I forget the statistics, but it might be something like a third, somewhere between a third and maybe a half of servers that are on the internet are going to be running this stack of, of technologies, okay? And the fact that OpenSSL was vulnerable uh, is actually a big coincidence, 
Okay, so the fact that we're going to use this uh, vulnerability in OpenSSL to steal SSL session keys, and they're both about SSL, that's actually totally a coincidence. Okay, so this is a bug that could actually exist in any tool that's used by an internet server that any random person could connect to. Okay, so uh, one thing about having uh, OpenSSL running or having SSL running in general is if you have a web server there, anyone can connect to it. Okay, if you're running OpenSSL, anyone can start talking OpenSSL to your server. So if there's some vulnerability in OpenSSL, then anyone can come along and try and exploit that vulnerability. Okay, and so there's lots of services that a web server is always running all of the time that anyone can connect to and, and use. Uh, so this one happened to exploit OpenSSL, uh, but the, anyways, that's sort of a coincidence, okay? Okay, so what, what happened in this case? So what happened in this case is OpenSSL had this kind of weird uh, property that, um, that no one really used. Um, Okay, so attacked on OpenSSL. So this is more of a server vulnerability, not a, a client vulnerability. And it, it typically... It's a typical SSL slash TLS library for Apache. which is very popular. Okay, so this is a specific level. Okay, OpenSSL had this weird button, or it had this weird uh, kind of protocol. It was called a heartbeat. And nobody used it, but it was supported in the library. Okay, so uh, sometimes you write libraries like OpenSSL, I forget when it was written, but like decades before someone found this attack, and it's some old code that no one really uses, but it's still there, okay? So code tends to grow over time, and not a lot of times do you go back and, and remove all the things that nobody uses anymore, it just sort of sticks, sticks around, okay? So they had this um, protocol, uh, it was called Heartbeat, uh, if you just sort of installed OpenSSL and you didn't uh, do any configuration, it's going to be turned on uh, by default. But not used often. Okay, the idea of the heartbeat was that uh, maybe I want to know whether your SSL, or your server is online first and foremost, and then secondly, you know, open SSL is supported, okay? So what I could do is I could try to just open an SSL connection to it, and then if it responds correctly, then I'll conclude that, yeah, you do support open SSL. The idea of this would be, uh, instead of going through that process, what you could do is you have this secondary kind of protocol where you could just sort of ping it and basically say, hey, are you there? Are you online? Are you supporting SSL? And it would kind of say yes, okay? That was sort of the vision. But the mechanics of it worked a little bit different. Okay, um, so the objective was you could ping the server to see that SSL support was uh, live on that particular server. So not all servers have open SSL or SSL in general. Okay, so the way that they implemented it is, what you would do is, I mean, you would specify that you're doing this heartbeat thing, and what you would do is you would, uh, so the user would send data, any data, just some bytes of data uh, to the server, and server would echo it back. Okay. 
Uh, so you might send ABC, and then it would say ABC back, okay? And then you know that it's online, okay? That's really good. <coughs> now, they also had this idea that, um, let's say you say ABC to it, but instead of it sending ABC back, that's kind of long, what if you say, I'm gonna send you ABC, but just send me back the first two bytes. So I'll send you ABC, it will send you back AB, okay? And then it will truncate it, okay? So they had this feature where you could stream a bunch of data to it, uh, and then it would just give you the first L bits or L bytes of that data. So for conceptual purposes, this isn't what bytes look like or anything like that, but just because it's easier to understand with words. Uh, for example, you might think of, um, so the user sends to the server, say, A, B, C, D, E, F, and then they might say three, and then the server would send back just A, B, C. Okay? Uh, so that, that will give you the right idea. Okay. Uh, so, okay. So this is all great. Uh, there's no problem uh, with this. Then what someone did is uh, so it turns out this code was kind of old. It was kind of legacy. Uh, it was written in a really low-level programming language, probably C. Um, and uh, apparently, just for your own interest, I think I recall reading that the developer of OpenSSL they used writing OpenSSL to teach them C. So they didn't know how they did they never programmed anything in C and so they use this as an example kind of first project to teach them the language. I could have been C plus I forget but anyways. Um, okay so with C there's all sorts of like really low level details and problems and when you define variables you have to allocate space and you have to free up space and there's a bunch of messes. Uh, some of them we used to teach in this course but we could generally help teach them. But conceptually you'll be able to understand this even if you don't understand the low level thing. Okay, so let's say you went to user server and you said, instead of saying three, well, let's say you said one, then what would the response be? Okay, instead of one, let's say I said six. The hell is strange? A, B, C, D, E, I. Instead of six, I say 10. Some random bytes from the storage. Yeah. Then kind of nulls, kind of. Okay, so I send something that's only six bytes, but I ask, send me the, just send me 10 of those six bytes back. Okay, so that should throw an error, right? But the way it was implemented, it didn't throw an error. So all it said is, oh, you want 10 bytes, great. I know where it starts, right? So this string is sitting in RAM somewhere. I know where it starts, so I'll read off 10 bytes from the starting point and I'll send that back, okay? So what you have is you have the server's memory, okay, their RAM, you have AD, C, D, E, F sitting somewhere in RAM. And then you have whatever else the server is doing that's sitting in RAM, okay? And you have a bunch of stuff before it as well, okay? And so if you ask for 10, uh, then what it will do is, yeah, it will say A, B, C, D, E. So it will return you this, plus it will return you this and everything that comes after it up to this uh, number. So it'll give you this, that kind of thing, okay? Now, it turned out that you could actually ask for a lot and it would work. Uh, so you could ask for um, up to 64K bytes. Okay, so this whole thing we call a uh, buffer underrun. <coughs> It's kind of like the opposite of a buffer overflow, which also exploits this idea. With the buffer overflow, you're writing more than you've allocated space for. Here, we're reading more than the space that's been allocated. So they're very similar, but slightly different. Uh, so we call it buffer underrun uh, attack. And you could basically, the end of the day, even if you don't understand all of this, what's the end consequence? 
you could run up, walk up to any server and you could say basically, give me the last 64K of whatever is in RAM at a particular time. So that's fine. So you get a bunch of random stuff that's in RAM of a web server that's running SSL. What are the kinds of things that would be in RAM of the web server that's running SSL? Keys. OK, so keys are the main thing. So this key, because it's using it to encrypt and decrypt, right? that key has to be somewhere, because it's using it. Every time you get a new packet that comes in, you have to decrypt it. You have to have that key. It has to be at your fingertips. So where's the key that's at your fingertips that's sitting in RAM? Okay. Uh, so you could suck the, the key out. So we call this the session key. Before you set up the session key, so if a server has 100 connections to 100 people, it has a different session key for each of them. Okay. But all of those session keys are derived from a master uh, sort of public key pair. Okay, so this is sort of details of crypto. But anyway, there was a lot of question about whether or not you could pull that out. And the reason is because you use it right away and then you, you sort of put it in RAM and then you don't use it. Like it's kind of like the first thing that goes into RAM. And so anyway, the speculation was you could get it out of RAM in theory, but you would have to do this attack really fast after a server started up. Like it boots up, it puts that key in RAM, then you do this attack right away, bam and then you get the key. If you wait too long, RAM fills up with too much other garbage, and then it's outside of your 64 KB window. And so there is actually a, a company, um, I, I won't say the name because I, I forget, I have a good idea of which company it is, but I, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but they were kind of a well-known like content distribution network, if I, I recall correctly. And they had this challenge, and they basically said, yeah, this, this bug is really bad, but you'll never get our like secret signing key you know, for, for signing um, our Diffie-Hellman exchange parameters, whatever, the super secret key, okay? Um, and so they sort of challenged the hacker community. And what the hacker community did, someone figured out, is they figured out a way of doing a kind of denial of service attack on the server that caused it to reboot. And then as soon as it rebooted, they hit it with heartbeat. And then they were able to actually steal that kind of master key uh, that all the session keys are, are sort of derived from. Um, so anyways, that was, that was really bad. Um, so they were able to get the, uh, the key that's in the certificate. And we haven't talked about certificate keys later, but it'll make sense. Right, if fast enough. Now it turns out there's a lot of other stuff that sits in a server's RAM that's sort of protected. Yeah? Uh, this echo functionality seems unrelated to asking if that cell is enabled. Why, why would this? Yeah, I don't know why, uh, but anyways, you do ask it over the SSL port. Uh, so SSL has its own port, 443, and so this is tied specifically to SSL, so it's a little different than just asking is your server online. You are basically saying, hey, uh, you know, I've heard that you open, you run open SSL, yeah. Um, but anyways, yeah, I, I don't know the answer to like why exactly this set it up. Okay, other things that are in RAM that are sensitive, let's say you have a password, so you just logged into the account, then what it's going to do is it's going to take that password, it's probably going to have to hash it a couple times, and then it's going to have to go over and compare it to its master list of passwords. So it's going to pull its master list of passwords into RAM. It has the password that you submitted that's now hashed sitting in RAM, and so it's using RAM to do all of this work, okay? So passwords tend to sit there. You have a cookie, the cookie comes in, it has to check whether your cookie matches, we haven't talked about cookies yet, but we'll talk about them. But basically, if I steal your cookie, it's kind of like stealing your password. I can uh, hijack your session. Uh, it might be things that people have entered, right? So uh, one server that was hit was CRA, so Canada Revenue Agency. So that's our tax service. And uh, there was someone who exploited this on their server. And there were people who just filed their tax returns, and they were sitting in memory. And so they were able to pull off social insurance numbers plus all the, the private information uh, from that. That person actually got charged criminally 
or, and I think they were convicted. I forget the exact outcome of the court case. And so that was, it, this is just a reminder that this is illegal and unethical to exploit. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, but anyways, this, this is now long patch, but you were able to lift the key out of this server lock, okay? So other things that happen to be sitting there would be things like passwords, uh, cookies, uh, PII for personally identifiable information. Okay, so this is one way that we could uh, steal the key. So it's an attack on the implementation. The end result is key theft. So part B. Okay, a different category of attack is, uh, in order to steal the key, is what you can do is you can, um, you can, uh, so this doesn't always work, but I'll, let's roll back like, like a couple decades, uh, or, or almost a couple decades, and um, people used to implement an algorithm called RS, or sorry, RSA, okay? And so the way it would work if you've studied crypto, it's a public key encryption algorithm that uses some math. Uh, you would take your session key that you want to use, you would encrypt it in uh, RSA, you would send it off to the server. Okay? Server would decrypt it in terms of RSA. The decryption process involves some mathematical operations called modular exponentiations. Um, now it turns out that depending on the exact value of the key, the number of modular exponentiations that you had to do would change. Okay? So there were some numbers that would require more and some numbers that would require less. Okay? And so what you could do is, over time, is you could ask it to decrypt a whole bunch of things, and then you could take really sensitive measurements in time, if you're close to the server, for how long did it take to decrypt it and then respond to that particular message. Okay? And if you sent it certain values, uh, and it took a long time, you could start to infer what, what was the actual exponentiation? What was the value it was exponentiating in, okay? And so it took a lot of trial and error, but basically you could kind of like suck the private key out of that timing information, okay? So we call this whole scheme, uh, first off, we call it side channel attack. So anytime you have crypto and you're gonna use some thing other than directly attacking the crypto, uh, it's called side channel. And then timing is, is the biggest category of side channel attacks. I'll, I'll give you some other examples that don't apply to SFL as well. Um, so this is called side channel analysis. And so you can do uh, timing attacks uh, in order to, um, so the most direct attacks were like you would literally pull off the decryption key. Then the, uh, so then the library changed so that um, they make, like right now OpenSSL, actually a ton of work has gone into it to make it so that every operation takes the same amount of time. So it doesn't matter what the values are that you're using, uh, everything, uh, is, is a constant amount of time. It's not the most efficient. It could be made more efficient, but as soon as you increase the efficiency, efficiency, you also increase the variability and you make it sensitive to values, okay? So right now it's very resistant uh, to timing attacks. Then there's more sophisticated attacks where you're not trying to get the key directly, but you're trying to learn something about the ciphertext and the ciphertext is either going to throw an error or it's not going to throw an error and you can do really sensitive Tiny information about trying to distinguish what exactly what kind of error it's throwing because it's not telling you what kind of error. And um, anyways, that the, this whole timing attack you can go down like do a really deep dive and attack very specific things with it. So there's an attack called Lucky Thirteen that's way down the line, not on the key itself. So I'll classify it somewhere else on the tree, but it also relies on on timing attacks. Okay. Um, other examples of side channel not related to SSL. Uh, so power is the other big one. Okay. So if you're decrypting something, uh, the amount of power that it takes, every time it does a modular exponentiation, it sort of consumes an amount of power, okay? Uh, so you can sort of see it. Or uh, another thing is uh, there were attacks, they were called acoustic attacks. 
And so what you would do is you'd actually listen to the computer, and as it was doing computation, it would kind of, I don't know what it was doing, like making clicking noises, or like the fan was increasing, or whatever. And you could, these were like really old computers, but you could literally like read someone's key out of like the sound wave that it was producing, if you knew exactly what you were looking for, and you knew what those operations were uh, that were being done. Um, yeah, there's also electro electromagnetic radiation. Um, so forget about SSL for a sec, but or crypto in general, think about an ATM. So you walk up to an ATM, you have a secret pin. Uh, for some ATMs, if you press the number three and you press the number one, it emits a little bit of radiation, okay, from the switch or whatever, I don't, I'm not an electrical engineer. Uh, but anyway, so somehow there's a bit of radiation, there is a slight difference and you can actually read that. So you could stand with a kind of very sensitive radio at a distance and you can tell whether someone's pressing a one or two or three or four because there's slight differences in the radiation or in the power consumption as well. So when you press three, it sort of consumes a bit of power. You see like a little spike in the, in the power and it looks, the spike, the shape of the spike looks slightly different than if you press a one. Okay. If you do like computer analysis and you have sensitive equipment, you can actually do this stuff. So ATMs now are resistant to these attacks. So you know, I'm talking about things that were possible five or ten years ago. But this idea of timing analysis, side channel analysis, you know, radiation, they, they always come back when there's new technologies. Like now it's IoT, or for example, where we don't have 20 years to learn the lessons of security and there's these new devices and they're really cheap and things like that. Sometimes these attacks uh, can come back, okay? But anyways, for SSL, timing attacks are one that can either net you the key or it can allow you to try and break into your tunnel as well. Uh, so, I'll go through this. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so what's changed, right, uh, what changed is actually the libraries themselves. So they just don't, they don't use a key in a time sensitive way. So it's not like they branch, like if the key bit is one, go do this thing that, that's three lines of code, and if it's a zero, go do this thing that's two lines of code. So they make sure that regardless of whatever the content of the key is, they do the exact same number of operations. Yeah. So that's the main resistance to it. And these timing attacks are sometimes, they're very theoretical. So like Lucky 13, which once again, it's not about getting the key, but it's, it is about attacking SSL using timing analysis. I forget exactly, but my memory is that you needed like tens of thousands of sessions to the exact same computer. You're trying to lift the cookie off the wire. So it would have to be the exact same website putting the exact same cookie into 10,000 different connections. And you also, the simulation was done on like a local network. So it was like, it's not a network that's across the internet from you, it's like in the same lab as you, that kind of thing. Uh, then you could start to like, you could start to read a cookie value off the wire. Um, but yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, let me show you some other ones. Uh, okay, so there's a whole suite of downgrade attacks. So here what you're going to do is you're going to downgrade either the crypto that's used. Uh, so the most important thing I guess to, to realize is that cryptography is negotiated. And, um, and so if a server does not support, let's say your browser supports stronger crypto than the server, then you'll end up using the strongest thing that the server supports or vice versa, okay? Now, because you're not using crypto, you have a problem. You can't use crypto to do your negotiation because if you already had crypto, then there's nothing to negotiate, okay? So the way these protocols work is the negotiation happens before you have crypto, then you have crypto, okay? So the negotiation happens in the clear and then at the end of the negotiation, you've decided what encryption to use, 
then you have the actual protections of encryption. Okay? Now, SSL was a little clever. And so what they did is they decided that um, you could negotiate basically what would give you confidentiality. So some of the cryptography goes into confidentiality. How do I keep secret the messages that go back and forth? And then the other property, or one of the two of the three properties, the second or the third, is integrity. How do I know that the message I sent is exactly the same as the message I received? So it turned out that uh, TLS would not, it didn't allow negotiation over the primitives that were used for the integrity of the channel, just over uh, the ones that were used for the confidentiality of the channel, okay? So what happened is you would do a negotiation and then once you got your keys, what you would do is you would say, this is what I remember you negotiating. And you would do that under the key. And then uh, assuming that the keys were set up correctly, then the other server would have a chance of catching it, okay? So downgrade, it's sort of a complicated explanation, but the point of it is that downgrades were not just as easy as you jumping in the middle and the server saying, let's talk a yes, and you say, uh, I'd rather talk dense instead. Okay. At the end, you would sort of compare notes uh, between the server, and you only needed integrity to compare the notes, and the integrity was non-negotiable, and the integrity was never broken. Um, so downgrades were a little bit more complicated, but there were ways of, of downgrade, downgrading, like um, maybe you had a session, and then you're gonna re-zoom a session later. There were some downgrades in that specific scenario, <laughs> or there might be a combination of some sort of implementation flaw, and then you could actually downgrade, even though technically the protocol doesn't allow it, but you exploit some hole in OpenSSL or something like that, okay? So downgrade, downgrading was never, um, it was never simple, uh, but it was possible. Okay, so when I say cryptography is negotiated, there's a couple things actually that are being negotiated. So one is the, the actual crypto that you're using. Okay, so the names of encryption functions, that kind of thing. Uh, so the actual crypto. And there's also the actual version number. So we mentioned that there are earlier versions of SSL and TLS. So SSL 2.0, 3.0, TLS 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. Um, and so you could also negotiate, you could try and downgrade the person from, like say the client says, hi, I'd like to speak TLS 1.2, right? And the server says, great, I can speak TLS 1.2, but you're in the middle as the adversary. And so when the server response comes, you change it to, oh, sorry, I don't su support TLS 1.2, I support SSL 3.0 only, right? Then the client says, great, I support SSL 3.0 anyways. You know, I'd love to talk TLS 1.2, but, since you don't support it, I use SSL 3.0. Then you start talking SSL 3.0, but then it uses S SSL 3.0's uh, mechanism for validating whether that uh, negotiation of the version numbers was correct or not. So if there's some flaw in that negotiation or an implementation flaw, then you can sneak these downgrades through, okay? So there were a couple very specific attacks that threaded a kind of downgrade through a bunch of loops uh, in order to, to actually make it work. So uh, you can read entire papers about it. A uh, recent paper that did this is called Free. Uh, so I'll just add it, but I won't, I won't comment uh, on it anymore. Um, so I'll just note that there's uh, version downgrades <coughs> and uh, the fancy word for the types of crypto that you use, we call them cypher speed. Uh, and freak, I, it's hard to classify because it actually does both. Uh, so it, um, it downgrades your version first, and then it turns out that in old versions of uh, SSL, they have one mode of encryption that's really, really good, which is don't use any encryption at all. So they actually had like no encryption. So there's still some use cases where you might want integrity, but you don't really care about confidentiality. And so uh, anyways, you, they call that the null cipher uh, or the null suite and basically means no encryption. And so if you can downgrade the version to an old version where that was a possibility, then you can maybe get that cipher suite used and then you can just rebuild. Um, 
So freak was, was kind of a weird attack that combined a bunch of different vulnerabilities that, that was able to achieve that. Uh, you can also downgrade it to um, really weak. So earlier on, there were very weak uh, encryptions that could be brute force uh, that were also used. Uh, RSA 512, for example, uh, that kind of thing. Okay, the final category I'll, I'll talk about is, is partial detection. I'll illustrate this with one example. There's a bunch of other ways that, that kind of work. They kind of work the same way. They, they exploit slightly different things in the Cypher suite. But uh, the, the first example I'll give you is something that we can understand even if we don't really understand crypto. OK, so it's called crime. So here's Alice. Uh, she's sitting here and she has a web page open. And I'm the adversary. And maybe because I'm in the middle already, uh, I see her connect to HTTP, any website that's HTTP. And I just drop in my own HTML file or I drop in an iframe with my own code. Okay, so this is uh, the adversary's uh, JavaScript. Okay. Now, what JavaScript can do is it can create uh, connections arbitrarily. So it can go say, you know, go download this code from Google. Okay, I need this JavaScript code from Google, so it can open up a connection from Google and kind of drop it in. Okay, so let's assume that I do that. So I go over to Google. I make some requests. And then I get back some response. And then I can do something with that response uh, inside my JavaScript or whatever the case may be, inside my iframe. Okay. Um, okay. Now what let's think about what goes into this request. Okay? So this request is from Alice's browser to Google. The fact that it's coming from inside this JavaScript. Basically, no one's really paying attention to. There's a few side cases where you might pay attention to that, but let's just assume that no one's paying attention to how this request is coming out. It just comes out of Alice's computer and it goes to Google. Okay. Now, let's say that Alice is logged in to Google. Okay. Um, if she's logged into Google, then what happens is her browser will uh, take this request. And it will pretend to this request some headers. And the headers will include any login cookies that Alice has. So what's a cookie? It's just a secret number. It's stored by the browser. So the website doesn't see the cookie, OK? But the cookie will get appended to this request. Because the browser will say, hey, you're about to send something to Google. Let me quickly add this cookie value to the front of it, OK? And then let's assume that this goes over SSL. Okay, so then this whole thing gets encrypted. And it gets sent to Google, and then the response comes back. Okay, now let's say the adversary, the adversary was able to put this because she's sitting in the middle. Uh, so she's sitting here so she can read sort of the requests and the responses. And this request can go over HTTPS even if the, the root page did not, right? She can just ask for an HTTPS resource on her website. Um, so that's fine. Okay, now what Alice is going to do is she really wants, uh, or sorry, what Eve's going to do is uh, she really wants Alice's cookie. Okay, so she wants to know what this cookie value is, all right? Um, but she did, can't access it even though she can control this. So basically, this stuff is chosen by Alice, so she can put whatever she wants there. 
maybe it's a URL or whatever, but she can encode whatever information she wants there. And this is uh, sort of placed by the browser. So the browser glues these two pieces of information together, wraps it all in encryption, and sends it across the wire. Okay. And sorry, I should say. Okay, so Eve can choose whatever value she wants to have appear here. She cannot choose anything that appears here. The two will get sandwiched together and then it will get wrapped, get wrapped in encryption. Is there anything that Eve could put here that would let her infer what the browser is putting here? Okay, that's the question that we have, okay? And it turns out that if you don't do your encryption correctly, you've taken um, 6110 correctly, this might not mean anything to you, means uh, indistinguishable CCA2. Cipher, chosen cipher text attack 2, uh, that's the level of security that you need this to be. Okay, if it's not, uh, if it's only CPA or not even CPA, then you, you're going to have problems with this kind of attack. The exact nature of how you exploit it will differ uh, from the attack itself. Okay, but Let's say that this encryption is not being done quote unquote correctly, then it is possible to infer that information, okay? So one of the nicest, easiest to think about example is called crime. The C in crime stands for compression. And this was uh, applicable to um, some versions of HTTPS or other encryption-like protocols that, that technically aren't exactly HTTPS, uh, that employ compression, okay? So sometimes if both the browser and Google supported compression, then what they would do is they would compress this data first, then they would encrypt it, then it would get sent, then Google would decompress it, and then they would decrypt it. So one protocol was called Speedy, S-P-D-Y. It kind of is equivalent to HTTPS, I won't get into all the differences, but anyway, one of the features it had was compression. Um, UDP decryption, encryption, um, can also use compression. Uh, it's an option. Anyways, compression's not always used, but sometimes it's enabled. Okay. All right, so what does compression mean? So compression means that when I look at this request, you know, I can squeeze it, right? Like there's some maybe English words and there's some redundancy in those words. There's some way of squeezing that data, okay? If I have the same thing that's repeated 10 times, Instead of repeating it 10 times, I'll just say this thing times 10, right? And I'll send that across the wire, and then the other thing will kind of decompress it, okay? So that's kind of the level. You don't have to, like, compression is like pretty complicated, but that's the level that you have to think about. Okay, the other thing uh, to remember, okay, so this used compression. The other thing that we've already seen, which links back to fingerprinting, is Encryption is length preserving. Okay. So let me explain this the simplest way I can. I'll, I'll really reduce this down to a simple case. Let's say this cookie, let's say it's literally just this cookie. That's the only thing, just the value of the cookie. Okay, so the cookies, I don't know, it's 10 digits long. Okay? And cookies tend to be random because they're supposed to be secret passwords or kind of like keys. Okay? And so let's, and random data you can't compress. Okay? That's sort of a general rule of random data. So let's say that this thing is whatever, 10 characters long and it's random. After it's compressed, it's going to be basically 10 characters long. Okay? No problem. The adversary is allowed to put anything here. Let's say they also just pick a 10 character random string and put it here, okay? So you have 10 characters that are random here. You have 10 characters here that are random. When you compress it, total you have 20 characters. You compress it, it stays at 20 because they're random. You encrypt it, encryption will stay at 20 because encryption <coughs> is length preserving, okay? So all of that's great. What if Alice has a guess as to what the cookie is? So she says, maybe she's trying every possible value or maybe for some reason she has some guess. Let's say, let's fast forward to the part that she just by whatever, however she gets there, she happens to get it right. Then you're gonna have a 10 character cookie here. 
you're going to have the exact same 10 character cookie here, repeat it, okay? So one value, the same value, repeat it. Does that compress? If you repeat the same value twice. Yes, yes. 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 it's highly compressible. Yeah. All you say is there's this value, just do it twice, okay? So if she's completely wrong about the cookie, it's not going to compress well. And if she's exactly right about the cookie, it's going to compress a lot. So what she's going to do is basically, she's going to try some guesses at the cookie, and she's just going to sit there and watch how much is it being compressed. And the more it gets compressed, the closer she knows that she's getting to the cookie, and then when she finally hits the right value, then it will compress the most, okay? So she's basically using that compression feature, combined with the fact that you can tell how long something is, to read the cookie out, right? Which is actually absolutely crazy. Uh, because this encryption is secure, there's something wrong with the encryption, right? She doesn't have the key, right? And yet, somehow, she has a guess as to what's right and what's not, and she's able to infer some partial information, which is just the length, and yet she's use that, using that to actually decrypt it. She's turning, um, what she has is an oracle, uh, because she's able to see the length of data, and she's able to kind of turn that around and use it to actually extract data out the other end. Yeah. So uh, this method is it faster than so so Eve has already the request. She knows what is the request. So what she can she can encrypt it and then she can append she can like compute ten to the ten possible choices and just append it and she'll find it eventually the cookie by brute forcing. But is your technique faster than the brute forcing or? Yeah. So there are ways that you can. Um, what happens in block ciphers too is that uh, they sort of get split up into blocks. And so what you can do is you can sort of move the stuff that you know and the stuff that you don't know, you can sort of partition them so you have blocks that are mostly, like there's only one byte that you don't know and there's a bunch of stuff that you do know. And I forget if it works for crime, but there's a very similar attack called Beast that exploits a slightly different cryptographic thing. And uh, basically it lets you do what we call divide and conquer where you can do a one byte guess, and once you get that one byte right, then you can go to the next one. And so that type of technique might work at crime. I'd have to sit and, and think through or, or look back at the paper and see, but yeah. So it is quite possible that you can do it faster. You can sort of divide and conquer. Yeah. Okay, so the core idea is that you append a guess of the cookie, and if you're right, it compresses well, and if you're wrong, it doesn't compress. Okay. And so you can go back and forth with your guesses, and as it as it compresses more and more and more, you know you're getting closer. And you can always test whether you got the right one by just submitting it to the browser, or to Google and see if it logged you in or not. Okay, so this is a way where you're not directly decrypting anything. It actually only works on small data. So if, if you had a huge amount of data to, to do that exhaustive search of all the different kinds of data, it just would be too much. So you're not gonna read off like all the encrypted data. But if you have something that's small, like a cookie, and you just, all you care about is lifting that cookie out of the SSL stream. You have to know exactly where it is. You have to get JavaScript, and there's a lot of assumptions. So this isn't a very turnkey attack. But once again, it shouldn't be possible. It shouldn't be theoretically possible to do this attack at all. Okay? Um, a couple other related attacks that are kind of along the same lines. Uh, just in case you're interested, I'll just list their names. Um, so the first was called Beast. Uh, it exploits the fact that uh, when you encrypt the same thing twice, uh, you get the same ciphertext. So that's a property you shouldn't have. SSL has some protections against it. The protections were not adequate. Uh, and so it used a very similar setup to sort of steal cookies. Crime and Beast were actually from the same people, if I, if I recall correctly. Uh, there's Lucky 13, which combines this kind of thing with timing analysis. Uh, so that's another one that, that works. Um, 
RC4, so there, there was an earlier question. Um, uh, RC4 turns out that it's biased in certain positions. Okay, so when you encrypt uh, RC4 ciphertext, um, if you start with the plain text that's one, you end up with a ciphertext that's one better than 50-50. Okay, or if you start with zero, you don't get a one, zero, 50-50. You get it with some other proportion. If you can ask for a lot of encryptions of the exact same, say, cookie value, and if you can get that cookie value sitting in, and it's, it's really weird, but it's only certain uh, bit positions of RC4. So RC4 is a stream cipher, and it uses a pseudo-random number generator. Once it gets going, it gives you good randomness, but you have to like churn it a couple times before you get good randomness. And SSL didn't churn it enough, okay? So they started using it too soon, uh, is basically the problem. And so in that first block, there are actual biases. If you can run 10,000, if you get 10,000 encryptions of the exact same cookie value that's in that first block, then you can start to infer probabilistically uh, that, that there's an 80% chance that that's a one as opposed to a zero, that kind of thing. Um, and then you can also slide the cookie around based on uh, some of the influences that you have in the header. So you can ask for certain things to be put in the header that would move where the cookie ends up. And there's different like low level like network protocol games that you can play to make this attack work. So these attacks are all like very involved uh, kinds of attacks. They're not, they're not simple attacks. Uh, but, but anyways, under the exact right threat scenario, uh, they are possible, it is possible to decrypt um, things. Uh, there's another one called Pluto. So compression oracles, uh, crime, um, others, uh, so I'll just, I'll list them off so things like Beast, uh, RC4 devices, Poodle, Lucky 13. They all have really good names, except for RC4 devices, it's kind of boring. You break SSL, you should give it a good name like heart. <laughs> um, okay. So, anyways, I know a lot. Some of this stuff is just sort of me telling you the way things are, and and, and it's hard to understand without understanding a lot of crypto. But, anyways, at least we have a good sense of what's kind of in this uh, space. Are there any questions about this kind of branch of the tree? Okay. So let's uh, take a ten minute break. And then when we come back, we'll talk about subverting uh, the Like fingerprints, voice, you know, I'm using the password example, but like biometrics as a whole. So whatever that means for payments. So don't give me, you know, interact e-transfers, some other email transfer system that uses Visa instead of interact, and then MasterCard's version of that or whatever. I don't know if these things exist, but anyways. Okay. All right. Okay, so uh, we're sort of done with uh, this uh, kind of attack, so we're going to break into the tunnel. Uh, we talked a bit about how we can sit outside of the tunnel and still infer lots of useful things. Now we're going to talk about probably the most dominant threat, uh, which is let's get the tunnel pointed at us. So I'm calling this subverting server authentication. And just to remind you, here's Alice, technically her browser. She has a secure tunnel. She's dropping her packets into the secure tunnel. Other packets are coming back to her out of the secure tunnel. The question is, where does the tunnel end? If it doesn't end where she thinks it ends, right, then she's in trouble, right? If it ends at the adversary, then she has no confidentiality. So the whole attack tree, remember our root node, observe traffic sent over HTTPS from a man in the middle position, and so 
if the adversary is sitting on the other end of the tunnel, she can achieve that goal. She can observe each of the structures uh, from that position. Okay. So well, let's just answer this question. Where does the tunnel end? So SSL, Alice sees that she has a tunnel. So yeah, it's going to end at some server, but which server? DNS? DNS. OK, so DNS will tell me the IP address. OK, so that means that I'm routing my packets along a path to that IP address. But the adversary is somewhere along that path, right? So uh, they might terminate that tunnel at them instead of letting me go all the way to the there's nothing in um, the SSL protocol about IP addresses. It's completely agnostic to IP addresses. If you switch from IPv4 to IPv6, nothing changes in the system. OK, so there's this thing called certificates. Is that our answer? I guess. Uh, what's If anyone knows anything about certificates, like what, what is it? How does that help? Okay, okay. So you just described everything you said is correct. So uh, servers have these things called certificates. Inside certificates, there's public keys. They're kind of, it, there's a stapling of the server's identity to their public key that's attested to by something called certificate authority. We got to figure out whether we trust the certificate authority, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so what does that mean for us? So if the adversary wants you to think you're connected to Google, but you're actually connected to them, what they need to do at the end of the day is they need to convince you that, first off, they can make up a public key themselves. They can make up a certificate themselves. They can have a certificate signed. Can they get signed by someone that's, that you trust? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, that's, that's a different question. But at the end of the day, they can make up their own public key, the adversary. And so all of this server authentication, it boils down to one simple fact. When you, where the tunnel ends, the most direct answer is it ends at a public key. That's the end point. So what you really know is I have a tunnel from my computer to whoever it is out there that knows technically the secret key that corresponds to this public key, okay? So there's this public key the person doesn't just know the value of the public key, they can use it, okay? They can use it to sign messages, for example, okay? So that's where the tunnel ends. The tunnel ends with the person who owns and controls this public key. Now, is the person that owns and controls this public key Google? Is it Google.com? Is it Google, the company in Mountain View, California, right? That's a hard problem, okay? That's going to be a really tricky problem. And so that's sort of where we're going with all of this, is how do we actually solve that problem? How do we learn that this public key belongs to the person that we think it belongs to, okay? So all SSL, you can think of tunnels as it's between your computer and some public key. And then the hard problem is, how do you know who's, how do you know my public key? You won't connect to me, how do you know my public key, right? I don't know, you go to my website and you get it. Well, to go to my website, you had to have an SSL connection. So how did you do that? Uh, if there was an adversary there, they could have replaced the public key on my website and now you have the wrong public key that the adversary put in instead. Okay? So somewhere along the line, we need, to, uh, we need to start establishing that these people's keys are really these people. Maybe they can vouch for other people. I don't know. We have to build this thing up kind of from scratch. But what we're building up is basically a binding between people or servers and keys. So you can think at a cryptographic level, it ends at a public key. It ends at the entity that controls a public key. 
What does it mean to control a public key? It means that you know a signing key, or you know a, a private key that corresponds to signing key. You know the corresponding. So all of this at the end of the day comes out to keys. Basically, tunnels are from your computer to a key. Okay? And so if we had a big directory of, and it was absolutely correct, Jeremy Clark, this is his key, Google, this is their key, Concordia, this is their key, this whole problem would be solved. Okay, we could just we could just sites like we could just not explore this subtree any further. Okay? We could just completely solve it. Okay. So if we had that global directory. Uh, then no problems are here, everything is simple and easy. The problem is we don't have that global directory, okay? Uh, and people's keys change over time, right? And so even if you got it right once, then in, you know, say someone steals my key, well, that's no longer my key now, I have a new key, so I have to update the directory. But how do you know that I'm the person that is updating the directory correct? There's, anyways, it would get very, very messy. So we don't have that uh, sort of global directory of these things, okay? Um, So the endpoint of a tunnel is a public key. So now we have a new problem. We know where the tunnel ends, it ends at this public key, but the new problem we have is how do we know that this key belongs to the person who took it? So the first like kind of tool that we'll use to try and it's not going to fully solve this problem, but it's going to be a step along this uh, along uh, the solution is something that was mentioned elsewhere. Yeah. Okay. okay. Certificates sound complicated. There are some details that that aren't that relevant. There are some more nuances that we'll introduce as we go along. But for now, we're just going to work with a really simple model of what a certificate is, an overly simple model. And then we'll add detail as we need it later on. Okay. A certificate, a simple certificate, a simplification of a certificate is just think of it as a digital document. So it's completely digital. And it only has two pieces of information. It has a public key. Okay, the public key has some value, you know, it's maybe it's in hex or things like that, or basically some reference to that. Um, and then it has who it belongs to. Okay, so this is usually called the subject. And we're going to keep it really, really simple for now and say that we're not even going to concern ourselves with whether this public key belongs to Google, the company in Mountain View, California. We're just going to say, does this public key belong to the computer that answers traffic for Google.ca? Okay, so is this the key for that correct server, google.ca? Okay, and that's a different question of whether Google, the company, actually owns google.ca. Maybe I registered google.ca and that's my domain, right? So this is just going to say, yeah, you're talking to, you're actually talking to the owner of google.ca. Okay, we don't know who that is, but anyways, you are talking at least to that server. Later, we'll think about how we can add uh, extra validation to uh, take care of, is that person actually the person that we So a certificate just says, here's a key, and here's a subject, or here's the, the owner of that key. Okay. And it puts them together on the same piece of paper. Digital. Okay. So that's a certificate. Uh, anybody can write down any key in any domain. Okay, so if you want to create a certificate out of thin air, you can write down, you know, if you want to be Google.ca, you write down Google.ca. 
and then you write down your public key instead of Google Keys. Uh, so, you have public key. so just because somebody wrote these two things down together and it's being passed around as a thing called a certificate doesn't really solve any particular problems. So what we can do uh, as a further step is we can get somebody to sign off on this to say that it's right. Okay, so we could give it to somebody and we could say, I don't know how you figured it out, but somehow you figured it out and you really believe that google.ca has this public key. Can you please just sign off on that fact? And if I trust that person, then I don't have to, then I just trust them, okay? So a certificate technically is an assertion, basically a binding of or stapling together of a bunch of information. Uh, sorry, a binding. And then there's a signature by some authority that's basically saying, I, I'm vouching for the fact that this is correct. And the person that signs it, we usually call a certificate authority because it's this is a certificate, they're signing it. By signing it, they're saying I'm authoritative over the certificate. Uh, so I'm the authority. Uh, so it's signed by some sort. Okay, so let's say I go to google.ca, so I connect through DNS, go to the IP address, whatever, that doesn't matter. I'm talking to google.ca, and google.ca says, great, here's my public key. It's 04 AD blah, 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 45. Okay, and it says, furthermore, uh, here's a certificate, and look, it's signed by VeriSign. VeriSign is a certificate. That's fair. Okay. Uh, now, have we solved the problem? Do we now know that we're talking to Google? No. Why not? Because how do I know, like, the person who signed my certificate is using my. Okay, so it's signed by VeriSign. What does that mean, signed by? It means that they use their public key, well, the secret signing key that corresponds to their public key to sign this. What I could do if I'm an adversary is I could make a certificate that says Google.ca. I could put my key in. I could sign it with some public key that I make up and say this is VeriSign. I'm VeriSign and I'm signing this. Okay. So, sorry? Okay, so decryption will, uh, won't will play a factor here. So we're not worried about confidentiality. So we'll only deal with digital signatures. Uh, but even if we use some sort of encryption decryption, it still boils down to how do I know that that's the right key? That's right, yeah. Okay, so, so that's how you would validate a signature. So that's correct. So what that will tell you is mathematically, the secret key that corresponds to this public key was used. But my question to you is, how do I know that that public key is verified? Okay, okay, so we'll get there in a second. So that will be the solution, but let me uh, pose the question first. Um, So we have the certificate, it's signed by a certificate authority using some public key cryptography. Now my question is, how does Alice know the public key used to sign the certificate actually belongs to the CA? Notice that that's exactly the same question that we started with. How do we know that this public key belongs to google.ca? Well, we have this certificate. Well, how do I know the certificate's public key belongs to the certificate authority? Okay, so we actually made zero, somehow we made zero progress on this question. At the end of the day, we still have a key, and we have some company name, and we have no idea whether they belong together or not. Okay, so certificates by themselves actually do nothing. Okay, they don't they don't solve this at all.
Now, we'll talk about how we're going to solve this problem in a second, but I want to raise one other issue uh, before I do that. Uh, we'll just we'll sketch them in as the two kind of questions that we need to answer. Okay, so the first question is, um, I want to know Google's public key. So now I have this certificate that's signed by some public key, but I don't know whose public key signed it. Right? So I didn't. I kind of pushed the problem around without actually really uh, resolving it. The second thing is, let's say that for whatever reason, I do know that this certificate authority actually is VeriSign. I trust VeriSign. Uh, this is their actual public key, whatever. Somehow I resolved this issue. How did the certificate authority figure out that this was Google's public? So the certificate authority signed off on this public key belongs to Google, right? So they have some, some way of figuring that out. And whatever they did, why couldn't I just do that? Why do I even need them? I mean, if, if VeriSign can figure out what Google's public key is, why can't I figure it out? And if I can figure it out, then I don't even need VeriSign, right? So that seems sort of impossible somehow. Okay, so that will be our second kind of tough question. So maybe Alice could just do the exact same thing, then we don't need CAs anymore, we don't need certificates anymore, uh, and then maybe the world's a simpler place. Okay, so these are the two kind of core issues that we'll answer. So let me, I actually can introduce them. Okay, so certificate so certificates are part of the answer, they're not fully sufficient for these two additional Issue one, I'm trying to figure out what Google's public key is. Google gives me a certificate where some certificate authority says that this is Google's public key. The problem is I don't know the certificate authority's public key. Okay, so I haven't really just sort of pushed the problem around. Okay, so how do I resolve that? Okay, so the answer was suggested, which is correct, which is let's say I go down to the Apple store and I buy a brand new MacBook never turned it on, never connected to the internet, it's fresh out of the box, I take it out of the box and I turn it on, that computer comes pre-baked with the public keys of about 50 certificate authorities. Okay, So I turn it on for the first time and they're hard-coded into the computer. So Apple, the company that made the computer, they figured out somehow that VeriSign is a certificate authority, it's a pretty legitimate one. It's been around for you know twenty years or whatever, um, and we trust them. And you know we personally walked over to their offices and made sure that we had their public key right or whatever the case may be, and we put it in our operating system. Okay, we're shipping it to you uh, as a consumer, and so you're gonna uh, you're gonna have it right away out of the box uh, if you turn your computer on for the first time. Okay, so that happens. Every operating system does it. Uh, so uh, it could be OS 10, it could be Windows, it could be Linux. Sometimes your browser will come with a slightly different set uh, than your operating system set. Um, but when you look across them, it's basically all the same companies across them. There might be uh, minor modifications. Okay. All right, so Alice's computer. comes with a set of CA keys, 
parts loaded. They're called root certificates for reasons that we'll explain later. What do they look like? So I'll show you uh, for uh, Apple. So in Apple, if you open up Keychain, uh, you can see. Uh, so these are all the certificates that came so these are a bunch of companies that your computer trusts to vouch for people's identities and their public keys out of the box. Uh, very well-known companies like AAA Certificate Services, AC, Reyes, FNMT, Academis, Academis. Ad Trust, Admin Root. How many of these companies have you heard of? Barely a few. Komodo. Komodo? Yes. Have you not heard good reasons? Yes. <laughs> Cisco. Okay, so there's maybe a few that you've heard of, but first off, there's a lot, right? Like, that seems like a lot of companies. And what's the consequences of, let's say I can go and break into uh, T-Telesec global root class 2. Say for whatever reason I'm able to go in and, and I'm able to steal the private signing key uh, that belongs to that particular company. Then I can basically make up certificates for any website on the web. If I'm a man in the middle, uh, then I can intercept your HTTPS traffic. I see you connecting to Google. I just create my own public key. Uh, say it's Google's public key and then I sign it with the certificate that I stole. So every single one on this list represents a single point of failure. Okay, so uh, you know you just have to breach one of them, and if you can breach one of them, uh, then you can you can break break down the whole system. Okay. So there's uh, let me uh, grab a screenshot of this. <coughs> Yeah, some of these are owned by the same, so you can see the same company as a couple. Other th times it's not clear, but some of these companies are subsidiaries of others and things like that. So when we counted somewhat recently, we found that there's about 50 unique companies uh, at the end of the day. Uh, but that still seems like quite a bit. Uh, can we see who certificates uh, embedded in the browser? Uh, so the browser will, will punt to this list. So this is the list that will be used if you use Safari, for example. Uh, so the only time you won't use this list on Apple would be if you use Firefox, it will come to this list. But it'll look almost the same. There might be some other things. Um, OK, so it seems like a lot. Maybe about 50 companies. They're not well known. doesn't mean much, but at the end of the day, you're kind of trusting that your password is going to Google because one of these companies is saying it's going to Google, and you've never actually heard of them. You don't know who they are. There seems like a lot of them. They're all over the world. Um, yeah, so so what is, that's basically what your trust comes down to, okay? Except for it's actually a lot worse. Okay? How could it be worse than this? Um, so it turns out that uh, these root certificates, yeah. Okay, so how can you change these? Let's say one of these gets compromised. What can you do? So we'll actually talk, we'll spend some time on what happens when things go wrong. Um, the only way you can change it is through a system update. So OS 10 would have to send a system update to your computer, and then they would have to modify that change. Okay. Now, maybe your question is slightly different. Can I, as a user, change it? So I don't like whatever. Can I just go click it and delete it? And the answer is yes. 
Uh, so I could go in and customize it if I didn't like it. And then I might see some errors out on the web because I need to guess that don't match what's in my group still. Yeah. And so there are people, I forget on it, it's not as simple as like just clicking and deleting. You have to do like, um, I forget what the, the actual interface looks like uh, if you want to delete it. Um, but, but anyways, there is a way to actually remove it. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I forget what the interface looks like, but you, you can remove them manually. And so there are movements every now and then to remove, remove specific ones that people don't like for a variety of reasons. We'll talk about some of those reasons. Okay, so we have about 50 companies. And these things are, what I, what I mentioned, they're called group certificates. Um, so let me explain what actually happens. Let, let's actually look at an example. Um, so let's say we go to, let's go to Google Docs. And uh, actually, I'm going to go to Twitter just because I, I know the answer for Google, and it's, it's not as interesting. Um, OK. So by the way, if you ever want to see the certificate, I'm not responsible for anything on that one. Um, OK. Uh, so Safari is using an encrypted connection to Twitter.com. Then you can click Show Certificate, and you can actually see the details of the certificate. OK. And so what you can see is that Twitter.com has a certificate. And so uh, it has. You know, here's uh, let's see. So here's the actual key value. Okay. So like I said, I simplify a certificate to just this key plus the subject name, uh, which is Twitter.com. Uh, okay. So let's uh, so common name uh, here. So subject name is the category, and then common name. So this is those are the two most critical pieces of information. But there's a bunch of other stuff that. Um, so that's fine. And this is the certificate. You can see that this certificate was signed by someone. So it was actually signed by this company, DigiCert. And this DigiCert was signed by DigiCert High Assurance EB Root CA. And this DigiCert High Assurance EB Root CA, you can see the icon's a little different. That icon corresponds to the icon that was in my key uh, store. Okay, so if I go look, I think I, I grabbed that at the wrong value, but you'll see that um, this top level certificate is exactly a certificate that's in my uh, in my store. So everything's great, and it shows me the lock. It shows it to me in green, and we'll talk about that later. But um, anyways, the weird thing I want to point out is that this certificate that I know about, that my computer knows about, that was hard coded in my computer, did not actually directly sign Twitter certificate. What happened is there was a, a level of indirection. It signed a different certificate, and this different certificate signed Twitter. Okay, uh, and that's going to be relevant. Now, in this case, these two are both the same company. Okay, so two certificates from the same company happen to you know sign the same thing, but that's not always the same. That's not always the case, right? So, for example, let's say we go to Google. Uh, you'll see that in Google's case. Uh, in this case, these two are the same. So Google is signed by Google, but then Google is signed by Global Sign. Okay, so Global Sign is a certificate that my computer knows about. It knows about Global Sign. My computer has no idea about Google uh, Internet Authority G5 or G3. Sorry. Um, so my computer has no knowledge of that certificate. That is not a certificate that comes hard code. Okay, and this certificate was actually used to use Google certificate, to issue Google certificate. So if I want to impersonate Google, it's true, I could compromise global sign, but I could also compromise this intermediate certificate. Okay? So the lesson here is that root certificates can actually sign other certificates, and those other certificates can sign site certificates. So when I say there's 50 companies that can sign certificates, that's actually not true. Because this certificate, I didn't see in my list, it wasn't in my list. It was a certificate that was signed by a root certificate. Okay, so in reality, what happens is you have 50 companies that are root cert CAs, and they can go out and they can go, "Hey Google, why don't you become a certificate authority? I'm going to sign a certificate that lets you become a certificate authority." Okay, and you don't see that in your list of certificates. So the number of companies that could be certificate authorities is a lot bigger 
than 50. Okay, so let's try and write this down, and then we'll 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 kind of go over the details of, of what it means as we write it down. Um, so the first thing is that we have this concept of what we call intermediate points, or sometimes they're called subsidiary certificates. Okay, so the idea is that I have a root certificate. Uh, a root certificate, you can actually think of it as a certificate if you want. So it would say something like, here's the CA, um, so the subject would be the CA, and then the public key of the CA. Maybe whatever value. And then it's actually could be signed. So the difference between just listing, here's the CA and their public key and a certificate is that it's signed. Uh, in this case, who's going to sign it? Well, this is a root certificate, like it's something that's coming hard coded. So there's no one to sign it, like there's no higher authority. Um, so in most of these cases, it's just signed by the same person, uh, the CA itself. So uh, technic in technical terms, we call it self signed. So a self signed certificate just means that the person signing it for themselves. So these are usually stored as uh, self signed. So we have the root certificate, and then over here we have the site certificate. Okay, so the subject can be whatever Google, and Google has this public key. Okay, and this is going to be signed by some other CA, called CA prime prime. Okay, and the point is that this doesn't have to correspond to a root. What we can have is we can have some CAs in the middle. So this CA can go ahead and sign a certificate for another CA, so CA prime. So they have a different public key. And the signature here is from this CA. From this CA. Okay. So this CA signs this certificate, right? And then this company, CA prime, says, oh, there's another certificate authority, CA prime prime. They have this public key, and I'm going to sign off on that fact. So CA prime will sign CA double prime's certificate, and then CA double prime will sign Google's certificate. Um, so this is called a certificate chain. So we call this a site certificate, we call this a root certificate, and then these things are intermediate. The whole thing is called a certificate chain. Okay. And the point is that we know that we have 50 companies here because they're in our root store. Okay, so we have approximately 50 CAs. <coughs> and you can see them in the root store. The problem is that when CA signs CA prime and they say, you can go be a CA, um, first off, it's not in your store. So you have no knowledge of who it is. And it can be a totally different company. Okay, So we did see an example where it was one company certificate signing another company certificate. But these intermediates could be completely different entities. Okay, So VeriSign could go say, hey, Ford Motor Company, do you want to be a CA? And Ford's like, yeah, great. And then they'll sign a certificate that says, okay, Ford's now a CA. Okay, so Ford Motor Company is a CA. And then Ford could go to, I don't know, Marks and Spencer, which is like a European or UK based clothing store, and say, hey, do you want to be a CA? And they'll say, yeah. And then they can create it. And if I'm sitting here looking at my root store, I have no idea that Ford Motor Company is a CA. I have no idea that Marks and Spencer is a, is a CA. But it turns out these are real examples of people who are. Uh, intermediate CAs, or at least at one time they were. So, you know, it could be Ford, Marks and Spencer, it could be the U.S. government, like the Department of Homeland Security, something like that. Okay, and the point is that we actually have no idea how many intermediates there are because you never see them. The only time you see them is actually when you encounter them. Okay, so when you go to a site and it chains back through them, then you get a chance to see it. Okay, 
So really, the only way to establish how many of these they are is to kind of search the entire web. So you can go to every website just by IP address. You start at 0 .0 .0 0 0.0.0.0 .0 .0 .0 and build it uh, all the way up, uh, 256.256.256. It doesn't take that long, actually. There's some really nice tools that allow you to do that. And then you can write down every certificate that you see. And still, you're not guaranteed to see them all because, because you're coming from Canada, they might be sending you different certificates than if you were coming from somewhere else. Or if you were on a private company network, you might see different certificates. Uh, so your view wouldn't necessarily be the same. But anyways, if you do this kinds of experiments, you see a lot more than 50. So you see, uh, it depends on how you count. Uh, it's kind of fuzzy, but you might see between 200 and 600 different entities. Okay, that are CEOs. Okay, now does it matter that Marks and Spencer is a CEO? What does that mean? Like, what does that mean? Does that mean they're are they as powerful as a root certificate? No. no. Okay. Some worried looks. Uh, so the answer is actually they are. So when you are given an intermediate certificate that says you are a CA, you can basically do everything the root CA can do. There's a few minor restrictions that you can put on it, like you can enforce a sort of path plan. So you can, for example, this CA made this person a CA, but they also said you have the power to turn anyone else you want to into a CA. But this person might be the power to be a CA, so they can issue site certificates, but they can't turn around and delegate CA powers to someone else. So there's very minor modifications that can be made. But in general, um, CAs, whether they're intermediates or roots, they basically have the same powers. And one power all of them have is they can issue a site certificate for any website on the internet. Okay, so let me say that again. Any CA, any of these 50, any of these 200 to 600 CAs, all of them can issue a certificate for any website on the internet. Okay. So if I want to impersonate, say, Google.ca, all I have to do is compromise one out of 650 organizations, get their key, and then now I can do that. Okay. At least in theory. So there are some additional protections that are done in exact response to this, okay? And we'll, we'll detail some of them as we go through this. But in principle, out of the box by default, without these sort of extra protections, that's what that means, okay? So the fact that we have hundreds and hundreds of these organizations is actually pretty ridiculous, okay? We should not be in this situation. Why are we in this situation? Well, the problem is that, you know, browsers started handing out certificates to companies you know, 10, 20 years ago. Uh, and it's hard that now when companies come and say, I want to be a CA and look, all my competitors are CAs, why can't I be a CA as well? It's hard to say no, right? So uh, once you kind of open the door fairly wide, it's hard to stop opening it wider and wider. Okay? Um, so, and you can make money. I mean, if you go to CA Prime Prime and you say, I want a certificate for Google.ca, you're going to pay them, right? So they're basically, and it's not a lot of work, you're just creating this kind of digital thing. It actually is a lot of work because you have to protect your key and stuff like that. But anyways, you, you make money being a certificate authority, right? So uh, there's a commercial interest in it. And so that's why we ended up with so many of these uh, certificate authorities. Okay. Uh, so the most important key point, if you take nothing else from this lecture, Any CA can sign a certificate, a trusted certificate for any site. So what's the, the attack here? Um, so the attack, why is this a bad kind of situation to be in? So we are doing an attack tree, so let's think of our attacks. So what we can do is we have a lot of CAs that we can look at. We can try and find the weakest one. And 
there's a couple things we could do. We could just hack it. Okay, so I'll, I'll phrase it a little bit more complicated. So for each uh, CA. And uh, we can either steal their key or we can hijack their process for issuing certificates. They both end up being the same thing. Uh, then we can issue certificates for any site on the web. Then in theory, at least we can impersonate any site on the web. Or if I see you connecting to facebook.com, I want to look at your friends on Facebook. Then what I'll do is I'll just write a Facebook certificate on the spot, like on the fly, sign it with the CA that I've reached, and then I'll drop that in, and then you'll connect to me instead of actually connecting to Facebook. Um, so uh, maybe I should draw that out. But uh, basically, here's Alice. Here's where she's trying to connect to. Let me uh, put in a username and password for us. I think that's <coughs> okay. And so uh, what Alice will end up with is basically she'll have a secure tunnel here where Alice is sitting. Or sorry. And uh, what Eve will do is she'll actually create a fake certificate. Well, an illegitimate certificate. Uh, so the certificate will be for domain.ca. Public key will be Eve's public key, not domain.ca's public key. And she'll sign it by some CA where she's reached. She'll create the certificate, she'll drop it in, then she'll have a tunnel from Alice. Then what she can do, if she wants, is she could form a connection, secure or not, to Facebook.com. Okay. So whatever requests you send, she just reads it in the middle, then she drops it in a tunnel, sends it to Facebook, then Facebook will actually respond. So then Alice won't actually know, like it won't be like there's something wrong. Like she actually is communicating with Facebook. The only difference is it's being encrypted in the middle. Uh, and, and Eve is reading everything that goes past, or if she wants to modify it, she can modify it if she wants. Um, and so, yeah, so she can, this is what it means to be a man in the middle, is that you're sort of relaying information back and forth. Yeah? Are you assuming it's sequential, that Eve and Alice are the same? Yeah, so we always start from the assumption uh, in our tech here, I'll just go back to the original to remind us that uh, that, yeah, that exactly that, that she's in a man in the middle. So, yeah. so that's going to be the base uh, assumption. So observe traffic sent over HTTPS from a man in the middle. So how she gets there, that's another attack tree. Right? But uh, for this attack tree, we're just going to assume she does. OK. Uh, has anyone ever hacked a CA in real life? Yes. Uh, so there have been some examples. Uh, so two of them are uh, that happened recently was the Jamil Char. Notice Komodo, I don't know if you remember it, it's actually a list that's still in our list. Okay? Yeah. So they didn't go bankrupt even though they got hacked. DigiNotar did. Why did DigiNotar Notar go bankrupt but Komodo didn't? It's because DigiNotar was small, essentially. They were like a small Dutch like CA and the web didn't miss them when they were gone, but Komodo was kind of too big to fail. And so they said they sort of slapped them on the wrist that they let them uh, continue putting certain. Um, so, anyways, there's a lot of business that happens behind the scenes as well. Okay, um, and speaking of that, you know, if if you start thinking of this from a business perspective, right? So, how did you get in the CA list in the first place? While you were a business, you shook enough hands at Google and Microsoft and Apple uh, to get added, and Mozilla to get added to the uh, into the store. Uh, at a business level, too, if if say you worked at DigiNotar. Right? You could do some sort of insider attack. Like there is somebody that, that sees that computer that has that key. So these companies, they do set up these kind of elaborate ceremonies for who has access. And you need like two or three executives, and they all have to go in a secret room whenever they have to use, like, say, the root certificate key or things like that. So there's some nice articles on like VeriSign and how their procedure works. So you can take a look at that. 
Um, another thing that people are worried about is what if a government, so these CAs are all over the world, right? So you have no guarantee over the government of the country that these CAs exist in. What if the government just goes to the CA and says, now uh, we want your key, right? We wanna spy on our citizens. Uh, we wanna intercept their HTTPS traffic. Uh, so give us, we're gonna legally compel you to give us your key, right? Or you're gonna go out of business. Then the CA really has no choice, okay? So you can even use political influence so this is how sensitive the, the SSL thing is. It's not just about computers talking to computers. You really have companies that are involved. And when you have companies, you have governments that are involved, right? And so you could actually bring the whole CA system down just with government like pressure, right? Forget about any kind of technical attacks. Okay. Um, so we call this, um, yeah, so governments. So there was a kind of furor over, uh, there was one CA in particular, I don't know if they removed it or not. Um, so it's a UAE company uh, that's a big mobile provider. And uh, this company had been caught, uh, basically when you would buy a phone, it would come pre-installed with some malware, some spyware. Uh, it was put there by the government. Uh, and so they, they sort of got caught uh, doing that. And so people didn't trust this company anymore. They didn't trust the government, uh, the Emirati's government. They didn't trust this company. Uh, and then it turns out that this company was one of these intermediaries or to get started. They might be on route, but people were in an intermediary. So then there was this big pressure and a lot of like petitions and stuff to have them removed uh, from the certificate store. And I forget what the outcome of that was. But anyways, it was never proven that they did anything wrong in the HTTPS space, although they did do stuff uh, with malware on phones. Um, but anyways, that's an example that people often cite uh, for, for what it might look like for a government to legally compel uh, a certain thing. Okay, uh, why don't we break it here, and uh, next week we'll pick it up and talk about more.